Welcome to Bloomberg Power Players, the series that talks to some of the most influential figures in the world of sport about their rise, their success, and what the future holds. It's one of the biggest sports on the planet, Formula One. There's an estimated global audience of 70 million people for every race and home to some of the most famous rivalries ever. Since 2005, the biggest disruptors in the sport have been Red Bull. An amazing five drivers championships and four constructors championships testify to that. The man behind this success is the team principal Christian Horner, an achievement made even more impressive as Christian was the youngest ever F1 team boss when he joined the sport at the age of 31. Bloomberg's Tom McKenzie went to speak to him for our brand new series, Bloomberg Power Players. Christian Horner, thank you very much for your time. Pleasure. When you think about your career trajectory, principal, of course, of Red Bull Formula One, but also now a Netflix star in your own right, how do you think about that career trajectory and how you ended up where you are now? I uh, was completely by accident. Um, I mean, I started my career as a as aspiring young driver. Um, you know, I drove for, for several years, and then uh, you know, finance was always a limiting factor. So, uh, the sponsorship that I had, I decided to go and buy my own car and start my own team in what is now Formula Two. I then recognised that my talent was was you know not uh, enough to propel me to you know my aspirations of, of Formula One. So, I then focused on working in the sport that I'd fallen in love with and um, you know having won that championship as a, as a team principal and team owner in Formula 2 for three years in succession it's been quite a journey you know during the past 17 seasons indeed and just going back to 1998 you're at 25 years old you yep. make that decision thinking back on it now as a young driver, you'd had success in your early 20s. Mm -hmm. How challenging was that decision to say, I'm gonna step away now and pursue a different angle within this industry? I think it was just a question of being honest with myself that, that I was racing against talented drivers like you know, Juan Pablo Montoya or, or Nick Heidfeld, you know, drivers that went on to race in, in Formula One. I could see that I just wasn't quite at their level. So I think sometimes you've gotta be honest with yourself. Um, but you know, I love the sport, I love, uh, you know, working within a team. And I wanted to apply what I'd learned from a driver uh, to apply that in how to run a team. Do you miss driving, racing, that sensation, that feeling? No, not at all. I mean, it seems such a lifetime ago now. Um, but uh, it was a great experience. It gave me a great insight. You know, occasionally, I'll get behind the wheel in an old timer at Goodwood, but uh, that's about my limit these days. Well, you touched on this, the experience, the skill set that you develop as a driver and the overlap then to being a team principal. What are the skills that you were able to bring with you? Well, I think, you know, as a driver, it's a very lonely environment. You know, you're sat in the car, you're looking at, and what you want and feel is that the team are behind you, that, that, that you know, that they are at one with, you know, your aspirations. And I think that that was one of the key lessons that I took from being a driver of running a team, how I would have liked to drive for a team. Um, and, you know, having that interaction with the driver and, and creating an environment that brings the best out of them. How do you describe your leadership? style I'd say it's inclusive I'm, I, I'm not a specialist I'm not a uh, in engineering um, you know I don't have management qualifications but I do very much believe in empowering your staff and, and you know, making sure that you've got the right people around you um, and they're not telling them how to do their job setting the goal setting the vision ensuring that everybody's focusing on the right you know targets and aspirations in whatever workplace there are always tensions but they're pretty unique when it comes to formula one between the drivers the engineers yeah. of course the commercial side as well how do you manage and navigate those tensions and what lessons have you learned along the way i think experience is always a big factor and i think you know people are, are, are different and um whether that be drivers whether 
that be engineers, whether it be technicians or marketeers, you know, you have you have a, such an array of personalities and characters. But if your main focal point is the performance of that car, that is the one thing that everybody is aligned on, and that they are working together to help you know support and all play a key and vital role in. How do you think about the managing the, the big personalities of the drivers, particularly given your background, your experience? Well, I think it's just a matter of being you know, honest with them and I think having an open and honest relationship where you can communicate, that's a vital element. Mm. And we've watched it, we've seen it, but we haven't felt it. Being trackside, being plugged in, watching the drivers, the lights go red, then they go off, foot to the pedal. What does it feel like? What is that visceral sensation? It's a huge adrenaline rush. I mean, uh, you know, Formula One is an energized business and, uh, y you know, these cars are incredible pieces of machinery and engineering, um, you know, excellence. So uh, when you win a race, it's the combination of everything coming together. It's a combination of all the departments having done their bit to ensure that the car is delivering, you know, at its optimum. And of course, we have some incredible opponents, you know, some, you know, manufacturers teams, iconic teams that we're, that we're racing against and that just heightens you know that uh, that intensity of the competition. Constant calculation an incredible amount of stress it, what are your methods for coping with that stress for having that clarity of mind to make split-second decisions? I think experience counts for a great deal but of course you try and apply your knowledge to the areas that you can influence instead of worrying about about everything and I think you know to be physically fit as well it helps you to stay mentally fit so uh, uh, I endeavor to try and you know put a few runs in every week to, to ensure that just mentally I'm you know I'm sharp you know it's always an early night the night before a race um, again because you want to give your best you don't want to let you know anybody down this will not be news to you but of course there are rivalries within the teams of Formula One between personalities between team leaders between drivers how do you think about those rivalries? Do you see them as healthy? Do you see them as a catalyst? How do you manage them? Well, they have to be ultimately healthy because an unhealthy rivalry is a destructive, you know, situation and that can't continue within any within any team. But an element of rivalry can be a positive thing and you want competition. We want people to you know, compete to be on the race team. You know, when they see that team sheet go up before a weekend, who's on the pit crew, you want there to be a sense of pride, you know, in that, that, uh, you know, to be representing your team, um, you know, fills you, fills you with pride. And that's the same whether it's a driver, a technician, an engineer, um, that you, you generate that culture of uh, you know, pride in your work. And your rivalry with Toto Wolf is now famous. You thrive on it, don't you? Well, Formula One is a competition and it's a competitive business and people deal with uh, competition in, and pressure in different ways. Um, and so, of course, you know, Mercedes have been the dominant team the last eight years. And last year was the first time that a team has managed to beat them, you know, with, with Max Verstappen. Um, you know, take them all the way to the final race. And you saw emotions, uh, you know, run high. You saw the pressure, how it permeates, how people sometimes deal with pressure. I want to just loop back to the rivalry question and what you learned from the rivalry between Weber and Vettel and how that informed the way that you deal with drivers now. Well, I think the Weber Vettel rivalry was extremely intense and you know you had one driver that was nearing the end of his career another driver that was obviously at the pinnacle of his his career and in the indeed in the ascendancy at the at the time so um, it was a dynamic that spilt over into the team in that it was you know, it was unhealthy, it was divisive. And I think the lessons that were learned from that was to not allow a situation to develop like that, uh, to create any division within the company, within, you know, within the team. Who do you prefer to have a beer with? Hamilton or Verstappen? Verstappen. I don't think Lewis drinks beer. Coming up on Bloomberg's Power Players, Christian Horner talks about the huge changes to the finances of Formula One and... Documentaries like, like the Netflix series have had such an enormous impact.
Welcome back to Bloomberg Power Players. Formula One is trying to widen its global appeal. India and Saudi Arabia and Miami all added as new venues. Qatar and Las Vegas are set to become permanent race hosts going into 2023. And also there's changes ahead. Porsche and Audi, they will join the sport. We caught up with Christian Horner and we asked him, what does the future of Formula One hold? What's your take on, on the change, the dramatic change that we've seen within the sport after the ownership of Liberty stepped in? The, the cultural change, the change to the economics of the business. Has it all been for the better? I think the sport has changed. It's evolved immensely. I mean, Bernie Eccleston did a wonderful job in, in creating the brand that is Formula One and the exclusiveness of Formula One. Liberty have just taken that ball and, and run with it. And uh, they've brought in new uh, initiatives. They've opened up the whole digital media and social media side of uh, you know, the world, uh, which is where we were, were negligent you know, previously. And I think that uh, uh, that has brought a whole new family you know, together with initiatives and you know, fly on the wall um, documentaries like like the Netflix series have had such an enormous impact um, that uh, you know we're starting to break markets where previously we've been very poor. So, you know, the, the United States is currently flying, you know, with Formula One with its new uh, newfound popularity, and so and of course out of that comes commercial revenues um, by attracting new partners and commercial partners to you know into the sport. So it's a it's a, it's a win win. In scenario is there more that can be can be done on that front to grow the fan base no, absolutely I think we're just scratching at the service and what we're seeing is more and more youngsters coming to sport more and more young girls coming into following Formula One and I think that's a, a really encouraging thing and I think that you know once they come to look at it the most important thing is to keep them engaged mm. uh, so the racing's got to be good the product has to be good it has to stand up for itself it has to be inclusive uh, it has to tick all of those all of those boxes and you talked about that expansion the US Miami, a yeah. success, of course, for you, the team, but also for the sport. What is the impact of that push into the U.S.? Well, it's uh, considerable. I mean, we've got several U.S.-based partners now. We've got a title partner in uh, Oracle joining us this year. Um, we have companies like AT&T. We announced Hard Rock, you know, American entities, you know, ExxonMobil, for example. Um, you know, it's great to see so many American companies, you know, coming and getting involved, you know, in the sport in, in Formula One. Uh, there's a lot of demand, obviously, for the I of Americans, they love their sports. What are yep. the biggest challenges, though, to building out the sport in that market? Well, I think it's a matter of keeping them engaged. I think ultimately we also need a home hero. We need an American driver that's not just there for the sake of it, but that is there competing at the front for world championships and race victories. What for you would be the other priority parts of the world the sport should focus on to build out its success? Well, I think it needs to have balance around the world. So it needs, doesn't need to be too US centric. It's important that we have a strong presence in, in Asia, obviously retaining its historical presence in Europe, uh, you know, South America. Um, Is there a country that stands out to you where you think that would be fantastic to have an F1 there? I think there's so much demand. I mean, South Africa now want to have a race, which will be, you know, be great to, to, to racing on that continent. Um, I think China's an important market for us once that reopens. Um, so I think there's many, many markets that are pushing. Uh, to have you know the presence of Formula One in their territory. We've got a little snapshot here of the innovation cycles that we're seeing within F1, within your team. Where are we within that innovation cycle? How much more can Adrian Newey, can the team innovate around this car? A huge amount. I mean, the regulations introduced for this year are the biggest regulation changes in the last 40 years. So they're still very immature. And so the development, the development rate is fast, it's furious, um, but of course constrained as well by a budget cap this year, which means you know, we have to be efficient in the way that we uh, develop the cars because we're heavily constrained on the financial side. So um, it'll be fascinating to see how that development race pans out during the course of this year. So the budget cap does constrain innovation to some extent. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're limited to $140 million uh, to design, develop and operate these cars, which, uh, while seeming a lot of money, is significantly less than the teams were operating on, say, two years ago. So uh, it means, you know, return on investment is crucial, uh, that uh, you want to be sure that when you're spending a development dollar that uh, you're getting a significant return. Do the budget caps, do you think, are they ultimately going to compel the teams, force the teams that aren't already 
to become profitable businesses? I think ultimately it will because I think with revenues increasing, with a cap containing cost, um, ultimately the franchise value of these teams is going to increase significantly and I think you can already see that, that all teams, probably the first time in a long time, are in great health. You know, there's great stability uh, amongst the 10 entrants and now there's an awful lot of interest to come into the sport from new entrants, from manufacturers and that only drives up the value of those teams and franchises. I think it's great to see, you know, the interest that we're currently experiencing in Formula One I think in manufacturing factors like Porsche and like Audi, you know, showing real keen interest to get involved in the sport is, is a reflection of where the sport currently is. I think that's, that, you know, that, that's fantastic. You talked to them about this at the top, it's interesting, how you make this sport more inclusive, not just here at Red Bull, but more broadly the sport and lower the barriers to entry for yeah. drivers, for engineers. How do you think about that? Well, I think that's about getting involved at the grassroots level, whether that's with drivers, is, is engaging with them from a very early age, from you know, 11, 12 year olds that are, are racing in go-karts. Um, from engineers, it's, it's getting involved with the universities that we're actively with and, and then of course apprenticeships and placements, um, working with local colleges and, and, and so on to lower the barrier to entry, to make it more inclusive, to make it more diverse, um, that uh, you know, Formula One shouldn't be seen as just an elitist sport. We want to attract you know, a larger and broader uh, talent pool coming into the sport and as we invest in our drivers, that's that's what we will do and continue to do with uh, you know, the engineering staff to ensure we've got as broad a catchment you know, as we possibly can have. You've got more female fan base, it's growing, it's expanding, uh, women love the sport increasingly. What about a female driver? Is that on the cards in the next 10 years? Is that possible? I think it certainly is a possibility. I think that with more girls getting interested in Formula One, um, hopefully getting involved in, in karting at the grassroots of the sport, we'll see more you know, talent coming through the systems. And of course, there are categories like Formula W that are there to, to assist um, you know, girls, in, girls in motorsport. And I think it's only a matter of time before we see a girl that's capable of racing um, you know, at the highest level and going you know, toe to toe with, uh, with the boys. Coming up, Christian Horner on the pressure of inflation on the teams like Red Bull and is Formula One going green quickly enough? Welcome back to Bloomberg Power Players. Formula One has tried to adapt to changing times with improved safety regulations, credited with saving many serious injuries. But it is also under pressure to make changes in a very different way as it faces questions over its green credentials. And that is something that Tom McKenzie put to Christian Horner. Do you see, as we focus on electrification across, obviously, the auto sector more generally, that there's going to be a push now for F1 to electrify into and beyond the E-Series, that they we're going to see an end to the combustion engine when it comes to Formula One, ultimately? I don't think that'll be for a while to come. I think we're going to increase the electrification for 2026, so we'll go to a ratio of much closer to 50% uh, combustion power, 50% electrical power. We're going to go to 100% sustainable fuels, which again is, is an interesting area, mm. and, and that could be a key development area for Formula One. Um, could it involve uh, you know, fuels such as liquid hydrogen, um, you know, which could be a very, very interesting technology. So you know, Formula One can be a... Uh, a uh, a proving ground for you know these technical technological advancements and um, uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be fully electric and the sport of course not just on the track but more broadly around all of the logistics has a big footprint when it comes yep. to emissions is there more that you would advocate that the industry that the business can do to reduce those emissions well, I think that's where collectively we need to do more I think that the cars actually we're very bad at telling the story of the cars that actually emission wise a car during the course of a season will have less emissions than a than a, than a cow, um, but it's of course the, it's the carbon footprint created by you know the air freight, the sea freight of moving the parts, the people around the world, and I think that's where we need to work closely 
uh, you know, with Formula One to find ways of, of reducing our, our, our carbon footprint. You've touched on the logistical feat that is F1. Fold into that supply chains and the constraints we've seen, whether it's semiconductors or other input parts within the business. How has it impacted you? It is having an impact because obviously supply is a key issue and I think with other issues going on in the world at the moment, we're seeing inflationary rates um, exponentially you know, go through, grow through the roof. I think particularly in areas like freight and like materials, you know, we, we not only had Brexit to deal with, we then had, uh, you know, COVID um, followed by, you know, the Ukraine crisis. What have you been able to do to mitigate some of those supply chain constraints and the impact on the business? Uh, we've had to be creative. We've had to be forward ordering as well. We've had to take on more in-house, uh, you know, manufacturing, but of course there's certain components that you simply can't. Wages is another factor, talent, the attraction for talent, yeah. the battle for talent how intense is that battle for talent now well especially in the UK where we are based here you know there's seven Grand Prix teams within a 50 mile radius so um, you know the, the uh, competition for talent is is aggressive and therefore it's not just about how much you pay it's about the uh, the environment it's about the culture it's about uh, how you look after your employees and I think at Red Bull we've been very very good at, at looking after our employees about creating opportunities and progress career progression. As you look ahead, the future for Red Bull, five years, ten years down the line, what does it look like? I think it's a particularly exciting part of our development at the moment. I mean, this is our 18th season in, in Formula One, and I think with the advent of the, uh, the powertrain side of the business coming online for 2026, you know, as we gear up for that to produce our own engines, uh, other than Ferrari, we're the only Grand Prix team in Formula One that has engine and chassis on one site, on one campus, and that's tremendously exciting. And of course, then how we can utilize the skill set that we have in other applications like America's Cup, um, whether we design our own hypercar uh, is a project that uh, you know, is potentially uh, on the cards for the future. And so many, many exciting projects that complement uh, Formula One activities. What about the future for Christian Horner? What are your longer term ambitions? I think winning becomes addictive. It almost becomes like a drug, and I think that uh, you know, once you've experienced it, you don't want to let that go. And it, you know, we had four very competitive years in from 2010 to 2013, and having got back into a situation of winning with Max last year, um, the whole team is totally motivated to defend that title this year and and hopefully add to it. And I think, you know, I need no motivating um, for what the future holds. It's eye-watering. Um, you know the excitement that we have for the future with uh, the engine side of the business, with the way that the sport is developing, the new markets that we're approaching, the partners that we're bringing into the sport, the young talent that we're developing, the drivers that we have, uh, and the youth as well. Um, so it's uh, uh, it's a tremendously exciting period of our uh, you know of our story. If you could change one thing about the sport, click of your fingers, what would it be? I think I'd reduce the amount of regulations that we have to comply with, or or make the regulations simpler. I think the regulations are overcomplicated that therefore consume time, resource and effort. Um, so I think I would simplify some of the regulations that we have in both the sporting and technical you know, side of the business. And what do you see as the biggest challenge for the sport this year and beyond? I think you know, Formula One is enjoying a, uh, an incredible moment. Um, where it's in the spotlight and it's how does it and last year was an epic season it was the best season in probably 60 years you know Formula One racing uh, for it to go all the way down to the last race as it did and I think for it to maintain that element of excitement is probably its biggest challenge so, so that there is no one dominant team that we are you know, the first five races this year have been been fantastic and that's what you want to see at every race you know of the of the 23 races in a Grand Prix season. That's all for this episode of Bloomberg Park Players. We'll be back with another influential figure from the world of sport next time.